Good morning, everybody. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the miraculous. Yes. We thank you that you're the God of the miraculous. And as we walk with you, we can see the impossible you. become the possible. And we thank you for that, Lord. Help us to walk with you. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear your voice through your word this morning. Bless our hearts to receive it and the strength to walk in it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, we're in the book of Philippians. And we have, last time we looked at Philippians chapter 1, we did two verses. Hopefully we'll do more than two verses this morning. Um, maybe we could have the first slide up, please. John. Philippians chapter 1. Sorry? It's not having it. How dare it. Lord, help it to have it. A Bible? <laughs> I got Moses' tablet. It's the gospel. <laughs> Don't start. Okay, I'm going to read to you Philippians 1, verse 3. If you have a Bible, follow it. If it's on your phone, you can follow it there if you want. Okay, Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, which he planted, and he's saying in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in advancing the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident, confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this of you all, since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share with me God's grace, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to stop there, verse 8. Um, Paul's writing this letter to the church that he planted, and he's writing it 10 years on. So 10 years has passed, and he writes it, and he's now in prison in Rome, waiting to see Nero. Um, and he's going to be a witness there. Um, when you read this passage and when you read the book of Philippians, you realize that Paul had a special relationship with the church at Philippi. There was a deep affection, there was a deep intimacy that he had with the church and they had with him. Special relationship. He had gone the extra mile for this church. In fact, when you think about it, he went an extra 400 odd miles because uh, he was going to preach the gospel in the middle of Turkey, uh, which was Galatia. <laughs> if you have a mobile phone, could you put it on silent, please? <laughs> he was going to preach the gospel in Phrygia, Galatia, and Bithynia, which is in the middle of Turkey and north. And the Holy Spirit told him not to, or forbade him to, and told him, well, eventually, he went to Philippi. And we looked at the planting of that church and how Lydia and a few other ladies at the riverside in Philippi, it appeared they had pr prayed him in. And he went 
400 odd more miles than he'd planned to go. And uh, traveling wasn't that easy in those days. So 400 miles was a long journey to go. Um, and he went to reach two people initially. First Lydia, and then subsequently her household. But first Lydia, who God opened her heart. <laughs> what are you trying to say to us, Lord? <laughs> yes. <laughs> But don't call now. <laughs> we bind it in Jesus' name. <laughs> to reach two people. Lydia. Lydia, Lydia and, and with great sacrifice. With great sacrifice. Um, Lydia seemed to be a nice lady. The jailer didn't seem to be so nice in the beginning. You know what grabs me there is we don't choose who we minister to. Isn't it nice to minister to nice people? Yeah. That's why they let me up here in the pulpit. But there are some people you think, I don't want to minister to these people. <laughs> but we don't choose that. If you're following the Lord, you minister to whoever he gives you to minister to. Um, but anyway, Paul sold love for God and for those that God directed him to, and he reaped that love. He sowed much, and he reaped much, okay? And I want to look at a bit of sowing and reaping today. Uh, and the measure that you sow with, the measure that you give, will be measured back to you the same measure. But when you give, it's through your hand. When that comes back, whose hand does it come through? God's. How many know God's hand is bigger than your hand? Aren't you glad God's hand's bigger than your hand? And he pours it back in an abundance. Praise God. Um, so 10 years on, Paul writes this letter to the church here. And he says, from the first day, in other words, when this church was birthed in Philippi, you have been advancing the kingdom, it says in one version. Uh, and there was fruit that was growing and there was fruit that was lasting. Okay? And they partnered with Paul, it says in the scriptures we read, they partnered with Paul with the grace of God or the provision of God, that which should come from heaven. And this was the only church that we read of that was supporting Paul in his ministry, financially, and in other ways as well. But it was the only church. Now that was a miracle. I'm going to suggest to you, in the light of their circumstances. So if you want to turn, if you've got a Bible, or a tablet, or whatever, um, if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians 8, I want to look at what it says about the churches in the Macedonian area, which was the church of Philippi, and one or two others, I believe. Okay, so when we're in 2 Corinthians 8. Is that still off? Okay. 2 Corinthians 8, and I'm going to read 1 to 5. And this is the circumstances that the Philippian church was in. We want you to know about the grace that God had given the Macedonians. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, he prayed a blessing on this church of grace. And that prayer had worked. And that blessing had worked. And grace was flowing through them. So he says, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. In the midst of great trial... Their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. That's amazing. Okay? For I testified that they gave to their ability and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectation. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Okay. Now, what they're pleading to give to was the church at Jerusalem. The church, it appears, they were suffering in a famine and there was a great lack, in, especially in the church as well. And so they pleaded to actually give to the church in Jerusalem. 
Now, the miracle for me, it starts here, and I just want to fill it out a bit, but it's in severe trial and extreme poverty, they tapped into overflowing joy. Hallelujah. Do you think that's a miracle? Yes. I think they'd learn to tap into heaven, don't you? Yeah. I think they'd learn to rejoice despite how they felt, and joy welled up and overflowed in this church in a great trial and extreme poverty. But they first, the key was that they first gave themselves to the Lord and then they loved those who God directed them to. Which is the key to effective ministry, by the way. Don't minister on the horizontal before you minister on the vertical. Okay? As you minister on the vertical, in other words, as you connect with heaven, then you minister out of that connection. That's when your ministry becomes effective to those people around you. And that's when it's targeted. We're snipers for God, as it were. God's going to raise up snipers in our midst today. People who don't just put the magazine of verses in the Gatling gun and churn it round and fire it out. They're going to give you one bullet to hit the target. Okay? Not just with a word, but the word. We need the word for that person in that situation at that time. Jesus did that at the well. The, well. the woman at the well, it blew her away. She knew she'd had a divine appointment. She knew she'd met with the divine. And people need to know that they've met with the divine when they've met with you. That's why he's raising up snipers. We're going to pray for snipers today. Please. Mm. I haven't planned on that one. But I think it's the Lord. And they did it. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then who God directed them to. And they did it with great sacrifice. Where they learnt that... Where had they learnt to do that? Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas had birthed this church 10 years prior. And likewise, they had did exact, they loved God and they loved those who God directed them to. And they did it with great sacrifice. And that church learnt that from Paul and Silas. Their example. That church was birthed that way. What a church is sown in, it grows in. I'm going to say that again. What a church is sown in, grows in. It can work the other way as well. Sometimes, over years, we have seen churches that have been formed out of rebellion, dishonoring authority, disunity, and they wonder why they have problems. Yeah? yeah? As it grows. And it doesn't grow that well. So what a church is sown in, and actually, I know I'm talking to somebody here, and he may not be here, you may be on YouTube, but the church you've been going to has got problems in it, and it's because its foundation has been sown wrong. And you need to stand in the gap and start to intercede and ask God to forgive it so God can put it on the right foundation. So it's grown, it's sown in good seed and it'll grow in good seed. Amen. Some of you are in relationships that have been sown wrongly. And you need to repent of how they started. Because it's going wrong now. If you need some ministry in that area, come forward at the end. Okay. They tapped in, the Philippians tapped into the grace of God and heaven's resources. And they manifest the fruit that had been sown by Paul and Silas ten years later. You know, I'm doing a study uh, with a group uh, online at the moment in Genesis. Um, I'm starting from Genesis 1. I've never really done a study on Genesis 1. I've drawn from it, but never done a whole study on the book, starting at Genesis 1. And it is so gripping me, and I'm so excited. Genesis 1 to 3 covers the whole gospel. Amen. It's one of the most exciting yeah. passages within the book, I think. And actually, you'll never understand the book if you don't understand Genesis 1 to 3. It's the foundation to understand the Bible. But anyway, that's, that's aside. In Genesis 1.11, 
I'm looking at day three here. God said, let the earth bring forth the fruit tree producing fruit after its kind whose seed is in it. And when I read that, I couldn't get past whose seed is in it. There's a fruit tree bearing fruit and its seed is in it. Well, we know that, don't you? You eat an apple and you can eat the pips as well, etc. But the fruit you produce spiritual fruit that you produce has a seed in it and it's going to reproduce its kind in you and in others that see it in you and embrace it okay that's exciting have you ever tried to witness to somebody about God or tell people about God and they're not interested I know probably you've never had that problem All you've got to do is produce the fruit because the seed's in it to reproduce in others. When I was at university in my final year, a friend of mine uh, who I started, actually, he was a Christian, so he let me um, crib his results. While we were supposed to be doing experiments, I'd go and play snooker. And so he'd do the, 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 the laboratory experiments. He'd take all the readings and I copied them. Praise God for Christians, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't saved then. But in the <laughs> Barry's not going to let me forget that one. Anyway, um, in that last year, I watched his life, and he was growing fruit. He grew peace, he grew contentment, and he grew kindness. And I can't remember, and I used to talk to me about the Lord, but I couldn't, I, it didn't make sense. And I thought, this guy's crazy. He has a relationship with Jesus. You know, I thought, strange. But the fruit really impacted me because I, I lack peace and I lack contentment and I lack direction. I was in a mess. And I looked at his life and I thought, whatever it's, you've got, I want it. And within that year, that seed that I saw in that fruit started to reproduce in me and I became a Christian. Hallelujah. That's exciting. You know, you just bear the fruit and let people watch it. And there's a seed in that that will grow in them. Hmm. The miracle. This is a miracle in this church of what they're doing with Paul. In extreme poverty, they're demonstrating kingdom economy. In extreme poverty, they're demonstrating kingdom economy. They are supporting Paul out of extreme poverty and they've been doing it for 10 years. Do you think that's a miracle? I think that's absolutely amazing. They have, and not only that, they are now supporting the church in Jerusalem. And they're desperate to do it. They've got no preacher standing up, you've got to keep giving. Seeds in it. Yeah, keep that one on for a minute if you would. They are supporting, they want to support the church in Jerusalem, which they do. They have turned their lack into a river of resource. That's lasted 10 years and it's changed the landscape. Mm, Isn't that interesting? It's changed their landscape. Praise God. Ten years they've been supporting him. Now it might not be a rich church. What was been poured in may have just been poured out. Okay. So they may have not got a big bank account. But at least they are causing that river to flow through them. And changing the landscape of their their surroundings. Change uh, 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 their lack into a river of resource. But they first gave themselves... Actually, we're not called to live under our circumstances. We're called to live above our circumstances. And you need to see things from where you're truly seated, not where you think you're seated. Where are we seated? Heavenly places. places. We have the privilege of looking at things as God sees them from heaven. That's why we need to keep touching heaven. Daily touching heaven to see how God sees it. Yeah? Yeah? So we can live above the circumstances, not under them. Um, we remind ourselves that when we play golf in pouring rain. 
<laughs> anyway, that's another story. They first gave themselves to the Lord and to the people that God directed them to. And they, it says they gave not just to their ability, but beyond their ability. What do you think that means? Sorry? Over and above. It left them with a lack. It left them with a lack. You can give up to the point where you've just got enough for yourself, but they gave beyond that and it left them with an apparent lack. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, don't rush out and start giving stuff away until you've heard God. It says God directs you. But that is the underlining foundation. But if God has directed you, they gave to the point where they had nothing or they had a lack. That grabs me. You know, I've been there. It's scary. But it's, ex it's exciting. If you want an adrenaline rush, if you think Christianity is boring, be willing to give it all away for Jesus. I've been there. And it's left me at times with nothing. But that opened heaven over me and caused miracle after miracle to flow. Would you like to see a miracle? Regularly? Yeah. Amen. When I first went into ministry, I was running a Christian coffee shop. And the church, the church was in debt to the tune of thousands. And they said, you can run this coffee shop, but there's no resources if you want to run it, it's up to you. And God said, run it with no resources. Isn't that exciting? You know, it's the best place to be. If God's telling you to do it, he'll always provide for you. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. And we prayed the resources in. We first gave ourselves to God and what he wanted us to do. And then we started to minister to every. He said, there's going to be a harvest in here, so get ready. And we prayed in resources. Resources just walked in. It was unbelievable. I, can't, I haven't got time to tell you about how it all worked out. But we prayed it all in. And after six months, we paid off the debt, half the debt of the church. Nobody took a wage, but God provided for each one of us, and we paid off the debt. And everybody, that, and many that came in had lack, and God said, meet that lack. Now, often we dip into the till and just give it away. No, not to everybody. We needed to listen to who God told us to give it to. Yeah? And we always had more money at the end of the day than we had at the beginning of the day. And I don't know, that was a miracle. Just a miracle. Amazing. I remember just a little thing. One day this guy comes in. He said he was a Christian. He wasn't quite living the fruit of it. But anyway, he said he was a Christian. And he'd come in and regularly he was asking for money. And from time to time I'd give him money. Other times I said, felt no. But anyway, he came in this day. And actually my circumstances was I was in winter and I had a pair of shoes and I got a hole in my shoes. And I just got chill blains through it. And I thought, God, I need a pair of shoes. Now, I'm living by faith, no resources. And I'm saying, God, would you provide? And somebody came in and gave me a little bit of money, which should have bought a quarter of a shoe. So I put that in my pocket and think, right, I'm going to believe for the rest. And then this guy came in. His name was Paul. And, and, and he said to me, I need some money for a pair of shoes. And, and I, felt, I felt like saying to him, well, you trust God because I'm trusting God for a pair of shoes as well. And that's what I wanted to say, but it's not what God wanted me to say. And he said, you, you give him the money for his shoes. Now, he only wanted, well, anyway, he only wanted a small amount. I don't know where he's going to get his shoes from, but anyway. So I said, okay. So I went to dip my hand in the till. He says, no, you give him what you've got for your shoes. I thought, no, that's my shoes. <laughs> So I gave him it, and I thought, you probably wouldn't get a pair of shoes with that. Well, he came back with a pair of shoes and a packet of fags. Anyway, that was... <laughs> it's really on fire for God. <laughs> anyway. I got home that night, a bit miffed, and there was a letter on the floor. I don't know who it was from, and there and there was more than enough for a brand new pair of shoes. Isn't God good? When you, when you give... Beyond your ability, God pours in. I remember I was working in the States in, 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 in the, uh, this um, Christian organization. And um, uh, again, I, I wasn't being paid. I just had to trust God to provide. Uh, I mean, the expenses of, of the ministry were paid for. But anyway, after about a year, I'd saved up a few thousand dollars in the bank. God had been good. He poured it in. 
And then we had a missionary group uh, a couple come and stay at the, the, the organization's headquarters. And he'd just been called out of the aircraft industry and uh, to go full time for God, he and his family. And he had no resources. He was just trusting that God was going to provide. And we were praying for him, oh, Lord, bless him. And what I heard God say, okay, empty all your bank account and give him everything that's in it. Give him the thousands of dollars you've got. And I thought, oh. I gave beyond my ability. <laughs> that left me with a lack, in other words. And I gave him that, and I, th I thought, oh, okay. Bless him, Lord. Bless him. I knew it was God. It's just... You know, the flesh rises up sometimes, doesn't it? And then I was, I was also leading worship, and I was playing with an old plonker of a guitar. It was, it was what we called a cheese grater. You put your fingers on it, and it cut your fingers. You know, like the fret and the strings are that wide apart. Anyway, I said, Lord, I need a new guitar. Well, God showed me this new guitar in an art festival I went to, and it was a handmade guitar, and it was going to cost a couple of thousand dollars, and I had nothing in the bank. And God spoke to me. He said, that guitar is your guitar. Buy it. And I thought, God, I've got nothing. I've just given it away. So I said, Lord, if that's you, you provide for it. Well, I had to go back to England for a couple of uh, a month or so. so somebody had paid the... Uh, airfare so I got on the flight back I got off at Heathrow airport this lady came up to me she shook my hand with her right hand I knew her but she shook uh, my hand with her right hand with her left hand she stuffed an envelope in my hands and I opened it up and there was a, a load of uh, 20 pound notes and I said what's this for she says I don't know but just God's told me to give it you and for that whole month I went all around the UK visiting places where I'd ministered to in years gone by I wasn't ministering. I didn't share any need I had. But everywhere I went, people kept giving me money. I got back on the plane. I had more than $2,000 in my pocket. I thought, if I get mugged here, I've lost it all. <laughs> and I thought, God, you're amazing. Not only that, just before I went back to the UK, I had pain in two teeth. And I, I, I knew one of them needed a crown. And I thought, the other one needs a, a root canal. And, and I'm in the States. And I knew it was going to be into four figures. And I thought, God, I'm going back to England. I'll go and see me dentist and get some free or next to nothing, uh, you know, dentist work done. So I went to the, I went, I was about to walk into the dentist's near where I was living. And, and I heard the Lord say, no, wait till you get back to the States. I thought, no, no. Isn't God crazy at times? Don't you think? He's not very logical at times, is he? And I got back to the States and I thought, this is crazy, God. And I went to the dentist. He says, oh, yeah, you need a crown. And he said, you can have a gold crown, you can have a porcelain crown, or you can have a metal crown. Which do you want? The gold is the dearest. And I was going to say the porcelain, which was the cheapest. And what I heard come out of my mouth was, I'll have a gold one. Why not? <laughs> Actually, it didn't really matter because I had nothing to pay for a porcelain one and nothing to pay for a gold one. So it didn't matter. I thought, well, I'll go for the gold. But I thought, this is crazy. And I went home, and there was a letter on the floor when I walked into the headquarters, Paul Williams, and it was from a church in Derby. I'd been in this church for a, a short while, and, and I'd left. And they said, we believe that God said you're to be our missionary. So we want to support you. And there was, there was the money for all my teeth and more. Isn't God good? He just pour, he opens heaven over you, but they first gave beyond their ability in direction that God gave them. Be encouraged. God, great is his faithfulness. Amen. Elijah. You remember Elijah? 1 Kings 17. It's not up there. Don't worry about it. 1 Kings 17. Elijah, the situation is that... Um, uh, Israel had turned away from God. They were in famine. Uh, the heavens had been shut. There was no water, uh, water coming down. <laughs> Should have lived in this country, shouldn't they? Uh, anyway. <laughs> you know something? The other day I joked with Mo. I mean, we woke up and it's raining again. As you might well know. And I, I said to Mo, isn't it terrible? There must be an angel that's left the tap on up there somewhere. <laughs> and I was joking with her. And you know, God said to me, well, I thought it was God. I'll leave this with you. But I felt the Lord say, no, it's God weeping. God 
that's weeping over our nation. And it's not for the world, primarily. It's for his church. And he's weeping. And you know, we need to stand in the gap. If you're an intercessor, and if you're not an intercessor, you need to become an intercessor to pray that one in. Yeah, I'll leave it there. But anyway, so there was no rain. So Elijah, he's got no provision, so it's dried up at the brook of Cherith. He goes to Zarephath. He meets a widow woman uh, who's got a son, okay? Um, she's picking up sticks. God had told him, somebody's going to support you there. You'd have thought, well, it's going to be somebody who's got a lot of money, yeah? Well, it's a widow woman who's got nothing. She's, she's going to cook one more meal, and then she says we're going to die because they're at the point of starvation. And he says to her, cook me a, a cake first, will you? <laughs> so she's not going to even have the last meal. But she's willing to give beyond her ability. Yeah? But God promises to her through Elijah, every time you go to take some meal or flour or oil out of those two jars, God is going to fill them up again. And that was for two years God was going to do that, approximately. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Don't you just love that? You know, I worked it out. Two years, there's three of them. There's the widow woman, her son, and Elijah. Three of them for three meals a day, let's say, for two years. It's about 7,000 miracles in two years. When did you last see a miracle? Have you had 7,000 recently? (laughs) That's amazing. That's a river that's flowing. Heaven's economy is flowing into that situation. And God is blessing that household. And guess what? She's in an area where there's a famine and people are virtually on the death's door. And they're looking at her and thinking, how come you're getting fatter and we're getting thinner? Do you think they might have done that? Do you think they might have knocked on a door and said, excuse me, how come you've got food to eat? What's going on? God has supplied it through this guy. He's a man of God. Can we come and visit at mealtime? Do you think that was having an impact on their community? I think it was. What a powerful witness. And every t- she didn't care. Every time she went to the jar and pulled it up, it went, Foof! well, there it is again. Another miracle. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. And she's in the midst of a people who are falling through the cracks. Falling through the cracks. And Elijah and that widow woman are pulling him out the cracks. They are changing the landscape of their community. People are drawn to those who've made God their source and are living in it. I'm going to say that again. People are drawn to those who've made God their source and are living in it. And that's how we change our community. That's how we change our landscape. Oh, it's one of the ways. Yep. And God's been telling us, pull them out of the cracks. Do you hear it? Yep. Mm, powerful witness. Powerful witness. Finally, Paul recognizes on this church. Can we have the next slide, please, John? Paul recognizes on this church, there's the hand of God and the grace of God. Okay? It's very evident on this church, and it's been for 10 years. And he says confidently, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Since whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share with me God's grace. Now, Amplified also adds, and partake with me of God's grace. And I just want to finish on this thought. What God starts, he finishes. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to suggest to you there's a condition to that because how many know you can say at some point, no God, I don't want you to do any more in that area. And God won't finish that work that he started. Do you agree with that? Yes. That's just not an open promise that. 
That's a promise, and actually in its context, I believe it infers you've got to keep walking with God. In fact, in Philippians 3, he says that he will finish that work if you keep walking in the call of God on your life. All right? We'll look at that in another five years or so. What he starts, he finishes if you co-work with him. You've got to keep co-working with him. Okay? If you continue in his service and in his shaping and in his making. Mm, Not too sure about that one, Lord. And he says, you shared, they shared their grace with Paul and it enabled him to continue in his race and finish his race. Church, you need me and I need you. You might be sat there thinking, I don't need you. You do. But I need you as well. I need the body of Christ so I can finish my race. And you need me so you can finish your race. Now, if I fail you, God will use somebody else. But you need the body of Christ and that's why we need to be in the body. And some of you on YouTube, you need to be in church. Amen. Not all of you. But some of you need to be in church because you need to be in the midst of people here who can help you to finish your race. Mm. Sorry about that. It says there, finally, you shared with me God's provision through you and you partake with me of God's grace. Now think about this. This is exciting. I think it is. What they poured into Paul enabled him to minister and advance the kingdom. And what he was doing is saying, you will partake of my grace that's come from God to me. You are going to start living in my anointing. Amen. Oh, And you might not be able to be out front there on the front line doing it, but you can support somebody who is and you share in their reward. Amen. That's right. So the reward they're getting for what they're doing for the kingdom, you are getting that same reward and that anointing. You partake of Paul's grace. Hallelujah. I remember I needed a new car. Well, it wasn't a brand new one, but I needed another car. And I said, Lord, I, you know, and I felt to go to this uh, somewhere down in Wiltshire. And I was staying with a couple and the lady said to me, I need a new car. Can I come with you? I said, OK. So we went down to this uh, car shop, <laughs> this garage, and I saw the car and I knew it was the car God wanted me to get. So I thought, I hope I get a good deal on this one. I said, you know, what's the, what's the deal? I was a thousand short and I thought, oh, OK. I'm sorry, I can't buy it. And the lady said to me, why can't you buy it? I said, well, I'm a thousand short. She says, buy it, I'll give it you. I thought, ooh, it pays to take the body of Christ with you. (laughs) A week, a a month later, I was down at a, a meeting and God said to me, tell her this. I said, Monica, because you invested in this car, everywhere I go in this car, And what I do for God in this car or through this car, the reward and the anointing you will also have in it to eternity. And she went, wow, I didn't. Now, she didn't do it for that. But God was saying, you're going to share in my grace. I'll share my grace with you, but you'll share your grace with me. Hallelujah. And finally. God. What he's begun in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What is the day of Jesus Christ? Second coming. Actually, it's the first stage of the second coming. There are two stages. He'll come for his bride and to take them away. And then he'll come with his bride sometime later. All right. This is the first stage. Five times in this book of four chapters, God speaks about keeping your focus on the second coming. Please. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Short book. Five times. Five times he says it. God will finish this work at that time. At the rapture of the church when it's taken off the earth. 
but the work that you allow him to do in you is preparing you for that rapture so that you will make that rapture. Because some of us won't make that if we're not allowing him to make us and shape us the way he's wanting. Beware of digging your heels in and saying, no, I don't run any further in that area, Lord. Well, it lasted for half an hour. <laughs> God is preparing you for the rapture through this work he's doing in you if you will work with him in it and co-work with him. I want to go in the rapture, don't you? I don't want to be here for those seven years when all hell will let loose. Let's say, Lord, if you've begun a good work in me, praise God that you'll, you'll finish it, you'll make me, and I surrender my clay vessel to you to shape it any way you want to shape it. And you know, when you're clay on a potter's wheel, what do you do most of the time? You go around in circles. <laughs> and then what happens after that? You get shaped, and then what happens with that? You put in the fire, you get cooked. You look excited. But then what he does... You know, there are two types of vessels. Vessels for honour, vessels for dishonour. Some he puts under the bed. They're very, very helpful at times. Some of you younger ones wouldn't know what we're talking about. But you want to keep it under the bed. And that's the place. It's handy, but that's where it's staying. There are others he takes it and he puts it on the mantelpiece. That's my masterwork. That's the work of the master potter. And he puts you on display so that people may see that it's not just the clay vessel, it's the glory of God in it. And you glorify God. I want to be put on the mantelpiece. Where do you want to be put? <laughs> Let's pray. Hmm. Okay. If you're here this morning and you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, but you want to live above your circumstances and no longer under them, and you want to do it with Jesus and he can lift you above him, and you want him in your life, I just want to make this opportunity, just in case there's anybody here who's never made that commitment to Jesus, I'm going to say a prayer and include you in it. If you want to be included in that prayer, just put your hand up now and I know who I'm praying for. Yep. Okay. Yeah, put your hand down. Anybody else? This is the prayer. Father, forgive me for leaving you out of my life. And I want to change that, Lord. I want to walk with you. And I want you to lead my life from now onwards. Please forgive me for everything I've done wrong. And come and live in my heart. And I thank you, Jesus, for doing it. Amen. Okay. I want to make a challenge, but I want to say, you know, I want you to come to the front and the prayer ministry team. If you've been trained in it, will you come forward to pray for these people? But God is calling people to no longer be Gatling gun people, but snipers. And he's going to hone in your ability to hear the heart of God to move in the gifts of the word and knowledge and wisdom and be a person that just put that one bullet in and hit, hit the mark and cause people to recognize, wow, I'm in the presence of God. If you want that in your life, these people are going to pray for you for that gifting. Okay? Lord, we thank you for your word to us. Help us to live under an open heaven. Lord, we want to change the landscape around us. Yes. We want to change that which is in extreme lack and poverty into rich generosity of God's favor. And we pray, Lord, you'll use us. 
Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to do and minister to those who you send us to. And we're willing to give it all. In Jesus' name, amen.